One day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossil skeletons in the plains of Africa. An upright ape living in dust with crude language and tools, all set for extinction. My name is Colin Livingstone and I'm from San Diego, California. I attended California State University, Chico and graduated in 2012 with a BS in Electrical Engineering. I got a job working for a small electrical company right out of college. I worked full time and continued taking electrical engineering classes at a local university to further my knowledge in this field. Things were going really well and about four years into my career as an electrician I received a 33% pay raise. Shortly after this raise however something happened that had such a dramatic impact on my life I haven't worked since. My life gradually began to unravel. I would soon find out the world as I thought it was for the first 30 years of my life, was in reality nothing close to what I had thought. I had become a targeted individual. A targeted individual is someone who is linked to artificial intelligence supercomputers allowing all brain activity to be remotely monitored and manipulated through autonomous software agents. A technological convergence in science has given those in power the ability to control and manipulate every detail of society. Through deception and distraction, they have been able to create a cybernetic society by linking humans to artificial intelligent supercomputers. I don't want to go as far to say that everyone is continuously linked, monitored and manipulated by artificial intelligence algorithms programmed by the global elite but there is strong evidence that this is in fact the case and is now a reality. I have been a targeted individual for about four years and have always thought of myself as a common-sense rational thinker with a science-minded outlook for understanding the world. So I would have never thought I'd end up spending the majority of my time researching and making YouTube videos about a topic that the majority of people think is a conspiracy theory. After becoming a targeted individual in 2016 however, I became obsessed with the issue. As a targeted individual I am astonished by the technology used to monitor, manipulate, control, and torture me on a daily basis. It is so far beyond what is known in the general public, its implications so great, that I have a hard time thinking about anything else. You know, in many ways, a lot of what we're doing today in brain science is not only cutting edge within the sciences, but cutting edge for the knowledge base of humanity. We're going ever more boldly and ever more bravely into the brain as a final frontier of understanding, of engagement, and in some cases, of effect and manipulation. As I am forced into an incredibly intimate relationship with an incredibly invasive AI system, a system that knows more about me than I know about myself, a system whose thoughts have forced their way into my mind and have gradually become more a part of my consciousness as it attempts to override my natural thoughts and become the dominant force driving my behavior, emotions, thoughts, and perceptions, an epic battle between artificial and biological, computer and computer brain, as I attempt to navigate through this new reality, in this new world, this new brain. Brain. The human brain has no firewall, so there's very little one can do when a stealth technology manipulates, monitors, and maps the mind. The brain is not a large organ. It literally fits in the palm of your hands. And more and more contemporary brain science is putting the brain and its functions, consciousness, the mind, emotion, behavior, at our fingertips. If we look at an organ that fits in the palm of our hands as the brain does within its folds, crevices, within its depths and billions of cells and trillions of connections, it's every hope you've ever had, every dream, every nightmare, everything you love, everything you hate, everything you remember, everything you'll plan to be, from birth to the grave. And more than that, perhaps more expansively, the organ that fits beneath our skulls and here within the palm of our hands is the essence of everything that humanity has ever done and will ever be. All of our excellences, all of our evils, all of our benefits, all of our burdens, all of our help and all of our harms from this little organ. What we need to do to understand the brain is not just to build a telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope to look very far and very wide into the brain or to build a microscope that can look very deep and very narrow into the brain. We actually need to build a multiscope. We need to be able to look 
down at the level of the genes and the proteins and the cells and to look further up as how these build together to produce all the magic that we know the brain produces. So the way we're going to do that is to build a kind of Microsoft for the brain or Google for the brain where we're going to bring all the information that we have ever accumulated on the brain and bring it uploaded into this environment, organize it, because in some cases it's very messy and it's different scientists producing different data. We're going to organize it and then we're going to develop algorithms that connect all of this data to help us specify as, with as much detail as possible the entire structure of the brain. It's a global brain, an artificial mind matrix containing the information of a billion human brains, linked through each targeted individual's unique DNA resonant frequency, recording every neuronal signal, to create a massive database, a search engine, used by the shadow government to know everything you see, hear, and think. You may think this is a conspiracy theory but if you just listen to D-Wave's Jordy Rose in his own words you shall see. He constantly dog whistles to those that know the true nature of reality. The standard approach, the traditional approach to quantum computing, is modeled entirely on the way that computers are built today, the so-called von Neumann architecture. It's, it's basically taking the way that we build computers now and making everything quantum. The way that w we are proceeding, it goes down a different path, which in the conventional computing world is really a path not taken which is the idea of architecting computers based on networks of devices. So what's a network? Well, it's this collection of objects that are connected. And uh, in conventional computing, in software, these things are often called neural nets. Uh, we have a hardware version up in our head, it's called our brain. Um, the chips that we build are architected like neural nets. There are hardware versions of neural nets. Computers of the future are reaching an end because of the complexity of the requirement to program them. The brain does not need to be programmed. The brain learns. The brain is highly robust. You could lose half your brain before somebody notices. So what we will do is develop the technology where virtual agents virtual robots can learn the kind of tasks we would want them to learn and then to take these circuit designs and to begin implementing them onto neuromorphic chips. The unique resonance frequency of a targeted individual's DNA is used to create a link between the human mind and a neural processing unit. This creates a bridge between the physical world and the virtual world allowing virtual agents to identify, track, monitor, and manipulate a targeted individual. When I mention the DNA, my understanding of it is that there is a resonant frequency to DNA itself, uh, that all matter in the universe resonates, all matter is animated by sound, and as a result there is a frequency that is um, able to be measured that measures the rate of vibration for lack of a better term, of the DNA itself, of the human mind, and of course of the human body, and indeed every, everything else in nature. The exciting part for us right now is we're in our golden age. Uh, we have the ability through other advances in technology to know our whole human genome sequence. Three billion little letters of our alphabet. We understand, and this has made us both human, unique, and linked. Uh, our DNA alphabet has linked us to everybody and mankind. They have found that these microtubules whoops, have these little kind of connectors here and it turns out that these act like antenna and it turns out that they actually interact with the mitochondria. What's so special about the mitochondria? Most of our DNA is in the, is in the form of mitochondrial DNA and it turns out that microtubules are intimately connected to our DNA. Under the microtubule surface, a rich domain of electrical activity and quantum effects has garnered attention from researchers exploring quantum computing. Wouldn't it just be awesome if somehow you could build a quantum computer that solved a really hard problem at the heart of 
cognition. Wouldn't that be awesome? Within the tubulin proteins, which a microtubule is made of, an array of electron conducting hydrophobic pockets allow energy to pass through each tubulin in multiple potential directions. This forms a larger network of possible patterns that energy can exist in in the cylindrical lattice. In each hydrophobic pocket, the electron clouds of indole and phenylalanine rings may become shifted one way or another, much like a bit of data in a computer, a one or a zero, this quantum bit can also exist in a state of quantum superposition between both states. This alters the pathways that energy can inhabit in the microtubule. We sit in these physical bodies, or for a physicist, these are collections of bits that store the states of a variety of things that we hold dear. All of our emotions and dreams somehow resolve down to the states of uh, memory register somewhere in our in our consciousness or in our brains and our bodies. It's intriguing to me the possibility that you might be able to replicate that in a different substrate. It appears that such energy inhabiting the microtubule also possesses phase coherence. The microtubule has no change in direct current resistance regardless of its length and possesses other traits of coherence. While each hydrophobic pocket might constitute a quantum bit depending on how its electron cloud is shifted, the larger pathways for energy throughout the microtubule lattice may themselves be quantum bits. This is called a topological qubit. Hydrogen and oxygen bonds serve as a medium through which the electronic resonance of surrounding tubulins becomes integrated and synchronized the tubulin pockets of a microtubule are capable of a feat of synchronization that sounds even more impressive still. In a heat bath flanked by electrodes, a pumping of electromagnetic energy stimulates the tubulin to achieve synchronous vibration with one another, forming into long sheets and then rolling to form microtubules. Even without GTP, a nucleotide normally involved in the adding of tubulins onto the microtubule lattice. These synchronous oscillations in tubulin protein, excited by alternating current, are enough to form microtubules with their classic cylindrical structure. This can be observed using quantum imaging techniques. The DNA in a nucleus is connected electromagnetically with microtubules in the axon. And you can see on the photograph, it's known that microtubules surround the nucleus and there is possibly an interface, electromagnetic, not mechanical, not chemical, but electromagnetic interface between microtubules and DNA. It is by understanding uh, the individual resonant frequency of individual's DNA and the individual resonant frequency of an individual's mind that this, techni this technology is able to be fine-tuned to an individual. And the only reason for that is to hook up the technology to the individual so that they could then, once a frequency is emitted from a device and hits the target at the resonant frequency that that target's body, brain, and DNA are already resonating at, already vibrating at, they sync up. And there is, for lack of a better term, a frequency superhighway that is connected between the device and the targeted individual. So you notice DNA makes morphogenic field and that makes the mind. So I would just want to focus on this connection. DNA resonance code and the brain code speak the same language. If you decipher DNA code, you will decipher the brain code. While all other research is prohibited, restricted, unfounded, uh, the brain-computer interface is really well funded these days. Defense agencies all have open programs to develop brain-computer interface. It opens the doors for the mind control. And also it opens the door for technology-assisted telepathy. Let's define the telepathy. The telepathy in Wikipedia is defined as communication from mind to mind without the use of physical senses. So we can use computer to, to link it to the, or technology to link it to the one mind and then to another mind and make an interface, transferring the information. What they do is they go and get your garbage in front of your house and get your DNA. And then once they've got your DNA sequence, they can then go to a supercomputer and they can biocode 
directed energy attacks that will only go and bioresonate with your body. And it is upon this frequency super highway that you can send data and information and instructions to the targeted individual much in the same way that you can send data and instructions over fiber optic cables that power the internet, for example. And that's very much what's going on. They have unfortunately hacked the human mind, hacked the human brain and the human body. And it is once that, that super highway of frequency is set up between the device and the targeted individual, they can send instructions. And those instructions ride on the wave of frequency that it was tuned into the individual's resonant frequency and then they can send instructions that manipulate thoughts, manipulate emotions, manipulate behavior, and manipulate um, even the vitals and so forth, the heartbeat, the breathing pattern of the targeted individual. And they had created a digital model of Earth and everybody in it down to a digital GPS coordinates model up to even a vertical dimension of one and a half centimeters, every building, every roadway, everything. And what they want to do is create an internet of things where in digital space, they know exactly what you're doing in real time. They want to know in real time what shows you're watching, what sandwich you're eating, what part of the house you're walking around. They want to know everything. Where they are literally just seeing what it's like for someone to eat a sandwich, what it's like uh, the emotional response and the, and the brain activity when someone is insulted, when someone uh, gets love, when someone interacts with someone, all of these different aspects of the human ex experience so that my original thought was that they are using it to be able to program the technology itself. Robots, the smartest people. Artificial intelligence, AI. The idea is to port the software from the human brain. So what you've heard about AI is not what we mean by AI. What we mean by AI is a software system that can do literally anything that a human can do. Literally anything. In fact, the very nature of the research and development program that is going on in Seattle, Washington, and I think uh, by extension what's being done to TIs around the country is very, um, is very largely geared towards the monitoring of human beings for the specific purpose of recording every aspect of human existence to monitor our thoughts and to monitor our emotions and our feelings to inform computer software that is used on robots, that is used on computers themselves to make them as, as human-like as possible. And obviously computers are better at things than people in lots of different ways. So now imagine not only can they do everything that a human can do, but they can do everything that the best human at any task could do better than them. In 2003 they launched what's called the AI system, mm -hmm. which is an uh, intelligent supercomputer with the intelligence of a human being, mm -hmm. in other words an, a smart human being. Yeah but able to think 10 trillion times faster yep. with the access to all known knowledge and history and a complete access to the, to the internet and all of the communication pathways. So you're talking about a system that can make changes to its own source code and become better and better at learning and if we give it access to the internet, it has instantaneous access to all human and machine knowledge. It does thousands of years of work every day of our lives, right? It's just thousands of years of equivalent human level intellectual work. We're talking about electronic circuits being a million times faster than, than biological circuits. Just imagine being in dialogue with something that lived the 20,000 years of human progress in a week, and you'd say, listen, that thing I told you to do last Monday, I want to change that up. And this thing has made 20,000 years of progress. I think there's a few people that put it the way you put it that terrify the shit out of people. <laughs> right. And right. everyone else seems to have this rosy vision like we are always going to be here. But are we obsolete? I mean, is this idea of a living thing that's creative and wrapped up in emotions and lust and desires and jealousy and all the pettiness that we see celebrated all the time, we still see it. It's not getting any better, right? We might be here to make that thing. And that thing takes over from here with no emotions, no lust, yeah. no greed, and just purely existing electronically. And for what reason?